Baseball, A Conversion Confessed by Daniel Thomas Moran In 1957, my father experienced two earth-shaking events. He became a father for the first time as a result of my arrival in March, but more importantly, he suffered a loss from which he has yet to recover. That was the year the Dodgers left Brooklyn. And he's not the only one who's never gotten over that fact. Since then, my father refuses to watch baseball at all. There are still a lot of people in Brooklyn just like him. To those familiar with New York City, it is very much a city of neighborhoods. It is less so now, but for many, many years, people define themselves by their ethnicity and by the neighborhood they came from. There were Irish in the Bronx, the Italians in Bensonhurst, blacks in Harlem, Jews in Williamsburg. Often people could tell what your ethnicity was by knowing where you lived. My Italian great-grandmother lived in Red Hook for 35 years and never learned to speak a word of English. It is more complicated today with many more groups, but it's essentially the same. With these identities came rivalries which ran deeper than the subways and thicker than the water in the East River. Some of these rivalries were practiced with dirty looks and the occasional fistfight, but mainly they were fought on baseball diamonds. When I was born, there were 16 Major League ball teams, and three of them played their home games in New York, those being the Yankees, the Giants, and the Brooklyn Dodgers. Everyone knew baseball. If you could not get to Ebbets Field or the Polo Grounds or the stadium up in the Bronx, and most people could not, you listened to the game on the radio. Baseball players, baseball stadiums, and even baseball games lacked visuals. They existed as sounds and in the imagination of the fans who heard them. To actually see a game must have been something indescribable. Consider that the man who made the Brooklyn Dodgers come to life is a fellow named Vin Scully. He called his first Dodger game in 1950. He's still doing that today and will retire after this year. Can you imagine that? Everyone had their favorite team. Beyond that, and almost as important, it was mandatory to absolutely hate the other two. By the time I was old enough to root, I had little choice. Remember, my father was a Dodger fan, and no one hated the Yankees like a Dodger fan. And I liked the idea of eating regularly and sleeping indoors, so I made the default move and went for the Mets. The Mets were a pathetic bunch of clowns sent out to Queens of all places to somehow replace both the Dodgers and the Giants, who had both fled New York for California. New York baseball fans suffered the loss of guys with names like Willie Mays and Bobby Thompson, Jackie Robinson and Duke Snyder, and what we got instead were guys, guys with names like Hobie Landreth, Choo Choo Coleman, and Vinegar Bend Mizell. Somehow they managed to keep Gil Hodges in New York, even if he was a doddering 39 years of age. He didn't last long. Managed by the great Casey Stengel, they were admonished to go out there and play your heinies off. One day, in complete despair, Stengel asked his team, doesn't anyone here know how to play this game? In 1962, in their first season, they had 40 wins against 120 losses. Even if I was a young kid, by the time I began rooting, I knew I loved an underdog. So this was my team. By 1969, they managed to win the World Series, and I still can't believe it. Most people in New York still can't believe it either. In a universe of grand improbabilities, one of the glaring ones is surely the New York Mets of 1969. So part of my loving the Mets as a kid was really hating the Yankees, and moreover, to be willing to take the abuse from Yankee fans who believed that baseball had actually been invented for the benefit of the Yankees. Unlike the supporters of other baseball teams, they did not hope for the Yankees to win the World Series. They expected it. No, they demanded it. Some things never change. I hated the Yankees for most of my adult life for all the reasons everyone else hates them. So let's just agree on that and not go into it. But then, one year, I decided to take my young son, Gregory, to Yankee Stadium. 
I had been there once when I was only five and saw the likes of Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris play that day. I wanted my son to see the place with his old man, recapture some of the magic from my childhood, and maybe create some in his. I also knew in my heart that, despite my lamentable enthusiasm for the Mets, who did manage another series win in 1986 over a perhaps even more pitiable Boston Red Sox, they would never be the Yankees. I don't care who you root for. When you walk around in Monument Park out in that legendary center field and see those names, Ruth, Gehrig, DiMaggio, Mantle, Berra, and the rest, you're enchanted by the inescapable enormity of it. So, not long after that day, about 15 years ago, I threw in the towel, accepted the unimaginable, and started rooting for the Yankees. I was a New Yorker, after all, raised with a strong sense of entitlement and superiority. I was no longer going to be ashamed to root for the guys in pinstripes. Hey, they had Derek Jeter, surely a player for the ages and an all-around worthy hero. It felt pretty good, I must say, to assume dominance. The World Series was in the bag in spring training. It was not about whether we would win, but which team would be kind enough to supply the drama and allow themselves to be throttled and humiliated as we, once again, assumed the mantle of glory. In New York, we always counted on the fact that one of those teams would be the Boston Red Sox, who were still inconsolable and even furious about the trade of one of their stars, a fellow named Babe Ruth, in 1918. But then something incredible happened. No, I don't mean the Red Sox winning the World Series twice in four years, or even A-Rod falling in love with Madonna. In the winter of 2008, my wife and I bought a home in the south end of Boston, about a mile and a half from Fenway Park. In April, on a freezing afternoon, with layers of clothing and clutching our beer and gloved hands, we saw our first Red Sox game at Fenway. We got there pretty early so we could wander around and take it all in. We watched the game and then we looked at one another and agreed that, quite frankly, we were smitten. We might have even sang Sweet Caroline along with the crowd, a song I really dislike, even though the guy who wrote it was living in my hometown on Long Island at the time. Well, used to dislike. An awful lot of baseball things suddenly began to make sense. Even my father's insanity and unrelenting grief over the Dodgers' exodus from Brooklyn 51 years ago. There is something about this baseball team which actually more about this city. Everyone in Boston is a Red Sox fan. Everyone loves an underdog. And no matter what happens each game or each year, people live for Red Sox baseball. It did not take long before we got caught up in the whole thing. One night, we went over to Caskin Flagon to belly up and watch an away game with the crowd. We were really deflated when the season ended, and not so much because the Red Sox did not prevail that year, but because we would have no Red Sox baseball to watch until April. Next year, we hope to find a better way to score some tickets and see a bunch of games. We have come to love Boston and to love passing an afternoon or evening at Fenway. But I really have to confess two things. I cannot see myself eating chowder at a ball game. And I really liked Manny Ramirez. It took me a while to catch up to the rest of you on the Ramirez thing, but I want you to know I get it. I always thought the problem was that his britches were too big for him. I was happy when he inflicted himself on the Dodgers last year, I hope the Yankees get them next year. They deserve one another. I also, thanks to Ben Bradley Jr., think that I understand the whole Ted Williams thing. It's complicated. What isn't? And as for my son Greg, he sadly did what I hoped he might do that day I took him to the stadium in the Bronx. He is now 25 and a rabid, unapologetic, unselfconscious, and unashamed fan of the New York Yankees. In 2014, he came up to Boston, and we went to see something unforgettable. I got a seats at Fenway two rows behind the Yankee dugout to see Derek Jeter, one of the greatest Yankees in history, one of the greatest ball players in history, play what was supposed to be his last game ever at Fenway Park. 
The Red Sox fans who hate the Yankees with a passion that cannot be described admire Derek Jeter and gave him a standing ovation every time he came to bat. But you should have seen the one he got. You should have heard it. The time he blasted one over the green monster for the last time ever. The only time I ever felt anything like that was when I was in the turf club at Belmont working as a waiter the day Seattle Slew won the Triple Crown. But that's about horse racing. This is about baseball. One day, when I am deep into my decrepitude, I will say to my son Greg, you remember seeing Derek Jeter hit that colossal blast at Fenway? What a night that was.